Welcome to Finding Folklore, the bi-weekly podcast that explores all that is myth, legend and folklore in Scotland and beyond. I'm your host Ryan and this week I am joined by storyteller, best-selling author, podcaster and musician, Mr. Daniel Allison. Uh, Daniel, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me, Ryan. It's lovely to be here. So, Daniel, um, I know quite a bit about your your history of uh, storytelling and whatnot because um, we've we've been friends for a long time. Um, but would you like to give kind of a quick summarized version of how you um, how you came to be a storyteller and author and uh, globe trotting adventurer? And uh, we'll go from there. Yes, it's kind of hard to condense, or maybe it'll be really easy. Let's see. Well, I always wanted to be an author to write fantasy, and I'd been started to just make my first proper forays into that around 2008. And at that time, I got pincered by storytelling, by myth. Uh, one of those uh, pincers was discovering that the oral tradition existed, that storytellers like yourself and like me well, were people and that people actually told stories live and that this whole thing was a thing. And learning that this was happening in Scotland and meeting elder storytellers like David Campbell, who became a mentor, blew my mind and instantly I just knew sometimes you just know things, sometimes things just fall into place. And I knew this was my path, this was something I had to do. The other uh, the other part of the pincer was I discovered the work of Martin Shaw, uh, who's pretty well known in this world, but he's a mythologist who's also a wilderness vigil guide who would guide people in ancient, uh, uh, in an ancient ceremony, sometimes called vision quest, uh, sometimes called wilderness vigil and other things where people would spend multiple days out in nature fasting. And this is something that's been done in various forms in various cultures for a very, very long time. And he talked about there were similarities between initiation uh, journeys like this and between uh, between those things like that and myths. And this absolutely blew my mind and made me realize how much depth there were to these stories. I'd loved the stories as a kid, loved my Greek myths and so on. And then I learned and, you know, the trap door opens and I've been going further and further down it ever since. So it's quite a natural progression for you once you once you found it through through telling. So how long have you been a, a storyteller for now? Uh, so that was 2008. I started pretty much instantly, like, you know, managed to lie my way into getting a gig and then learn some stories. Uh, and so, yeah, it's been about uh, 15, 16 years now. And uh, I started writing seriously around that time. So I've been a writer, storyteller uh, that whole time. Okay, and uh, today you are going to tell us a tale um, from your your newest book. Uh, do you want to delve into that for us? Yes, absolutely. Uh, so I'll preface by saying that I uh, do two things. I have two series. One series is Celtic Myths and Legends Retold, where I'm retelling uh, Celtic stories, just trying to retell them authentically kind of with an oral feel but with a way that makes them very accessible and enjoyable and exciting uh, while still staying true and then also write mythic fantasy fantasy uh, set in ancient scotland uh, inspired by these stories and um, so in the series celtic myths and legends retold my newest book is irish mythology the children of danu in which i'm attempting to retell the first of the four Irish mythological cycles. Uh, so this is the cycle which involves characters people may have heard of, like the Morrigan, Mananan, the Dagda, Nuada, uh, Balor, Lu. And so uh, these are very, they're epic, titanic, towering stories, which tend to flow into one another and make more of a like continuous narrative, uh, perhaps something like uh, the Odyssey or Aeneid, um, more than kind of like your folk tales that just like, here's the story, lost short story, end of story onto the next one. So what I would like to do is to, uh, give you a reading of the first chapter or some of the first chapter. Sounds fantastic. I'll Good. let you just take it away when you're ready. Great. I mean, I should possibly, uh, preface, uh, this by saying that. Irish mythology 
doesn't start at the very beginning. There is no story of how the world was made. And um, Ireland is already there when the stories start. And what Irish mythology or mythological cycle at least tells us is a story of what's called a series of invasions, could also be thought of as a series of settlements by different races who come to the already existing island and fight for it or settle on it. Uh, so uh, in my book, there's a prologue which summarizes the early invasions, the first four. And then when the story really gets going is the fifth invasion. So there's already been a bit of a prologue in which this race, the Tua de Danin, they were in Ireland. They left after a terrible war in which uh, they didn't have a very good time. They went to the north of the world. And this is them, this is them coming back and coming back from being in business. Okay. The scene has been set. Okay. I'm excited to hear this. From the north of the world, in a fleet of golden proud ships, came the children of Danu. The wind was ever in their favor, for their druids had power over the wind. The sea did not trouble them with storms, for their champion, Mananan, was one with the waters. He galloped before them on his white horse, Enbar, her hooves dancing over the waves. On the prow of one ship stood the Dagda, who many called the good god. His fingers strummed his oaken harp, pouring joyous music into salt-sharp air. As he played, he searched the horizon for the land which would be his new home. His fingers itched to sink themselves into her soil, to plant barley and watch it grow golden beneath the sun. He would brew ale from that barley and drink it at a thousand feasts. The Dacta's harp was imbued with magic. Its song rang out over the entire fleet, all the way to a ship upon which sat three tawny-haired women, Babe, Maka, and the Morrigan. Mothers and magic workers, both gentle and ferocious, these three were loved by the Tua and feared by their enemies. They caught the visions of fields and feasts riding upon the Dagda's tune and added their own. Women, screaming in childbirth, couples in the throes of passion, the bones of dead Tua buried in peat. Life beginning, life lived, life ending. The Tua de Danin were immortal. Left in peace, they would never die, for the time to come was no time of peace. The Morrigan abruptly shifted in shape. Her eyes turned nightshade dark. Feathers sprouted from her skin. She spread her cloak wide and became a great crow. Wearing her war form, she beat her wings and rose high into the sky. The Tua had passed an unimaginable span of years in the world's frozen north. They had founded their four shining, shimmering cities of Gorias, Phineas, Murias, and Phalias. Within those walls, they attained life eternal, though they could still be killed in battle. So long did they spend there, so deeply immersed in study and sorcery, that they spoke less and less often of the home they had left behind. At first, they sang nightly of their eventual return. Centuries passed and such songs were forgotten. Memory became myth, a myth which weakened, withered, and died. Instead, the once Nemedians now dreamed and sang of Danu, the great mother who had revealed herself and revealed herself in the visions of their druids. They forgot the name of Nemed and styled themselves the Tua de Danu, the children of Danu. The Tua might have remained in the north had not a dream descended on their cities one night. That night, every she from kings to cowherds dreamed of a perfect island far across the sea. They dreamed of it every night for many weeks, and in these dreams they wandered her shores, swam in her lakes, climbed her peaks to gaze on her green glens. She was lovely beyond all words. Neither too rocky nor too boggy, 
neither too cold in winter nor too hot in summer. She sang a siren song to them, that beating green heart of a blue world, inflaming their desire until they could no longer resist her. It was clearly the will of Danu, they said, that this island become theirs. So the she set to work. They built a fleet of golden proud ships so vast they could carry them all. They left their homeland, taking with them their four great treasures. The shine, the shining sword from Gorias, the spear of victory from Phineas, the cauldron of plenty from Murias, the stone of destiny from Phalias. Druids and warriors, bards and smiths now strained to catch sight of the Isle of Destiny as they'd already taken to calling it. They looked with pride towards the lead ship, grandest of all. It sails as white as a midwinter moon. The Morrigan circled its sails and looked down upon Nuada, high king of the Tuadidanan. Brown bearded, honey voiced, soft smiling Nuada, a high king adored by his people. He planned to bargain with whomever inhabited the Isle of Destiny, hoping that it could be taken without the spilling of blood. Such was his people's faith in him that many believed he would succeed, that their swords would remain sheathed. The Morgan shifted her shape again. She became not one crow, but a host of crows, a murder of black beaks erupting into murderous music. She wanted the same things as Noada, yet as his she wanted the same things as Nuada, yet it is the wisdom of the crow to see through fantasies of friendship and kindness. There was always blood. Finally, a cry went up among Danu's children. The Isle of Destiny was in sight. King Nuada turned to his chief druids. Manufacture a mist, he said. Ensure we are not spotted. The druids obeyed, and soon a cloud of fog enshrouded the fleet. They turned west and south, skirting the coast until the navigators spied a likely landing place. The Tua de... The Tua came ashore in the region they would soon call Connor. Still shielded by the druid fog, they heaved their boats ashore and at Nuada's command, put them to the torch. Had it not been for the magical mist, the smoke from that blaze would have been visible all across Connor. It would have darkened the skies of Ulster in the north and Munster in the south. The smoke would have been spied in easternmost Leinster, where Oki, high king of the Firbolgs, held court at Tara. Nuada had his druids maintain their spell for many days. Few armies could match the Shi in battle, but he was not foolhardy. He ordered his people to build and secure a shoreside camp, and only once it was complete did the druids lift the mist. The vast camp, with its high walls, sentry towers, and fluttering banners, was soon spotted by local farmers and fishers. Messengers ran to Tara with news of the invasion. There are thousands of them. They are taller than us and well armed. They arrived in a fog which must have been the work of powerful druids. Oki listened from his throne, a cup of ale in hand. His mind raced, yet he did his best to appear untroubled as he surveyed his hull. Torches burned in braziers. A great fire pit ran down the center. Hounds lazing beside it while meat roasted on skewers over the flames. The tables that lined the hall were crowded with chiefs and champions, warriors and wordsmiths. Every one of them was watching him silently, gauging his reaction to the news. He must not show fear. Fear meant weakness. To some among his chiefs, weakness in their leader meant opportunity. Oki yawned, 
sipped his ale and said, Sreng, come forward. Oki's champion rose from his seat and came to stand before the messengers. They craned their necks to look up at him, their eyes wide, taking in his oak-thick arms, his ale-barrel chest, his spear that could have skewered a bear. Tell me, said Oki, did these strangers appear stronger than this man? No, no, no sire. Sreng looked down at them with impassive eyes. He was Oki's oldest friend, fiercely loyal and the finest fighter among the Firbolgs. On top of that, he was generous, forgiving, quick with a jest, yet Oki preferred his court not to know that. Oki caught Sreng's eye and nodded. Sreng's hand shot out and clasped the neck of the nearest messenger. He lifted him into the air, squeezing his neck so that his face turned bruised purple. We need not fear these foreigners. The foreigners should fear the furbogs, said Oki, as the assembly laughed and bellowed their agreement, pounding their fists on the tables. Sreng released the messenger, who collapsed to his knees as Oki stood. Sreng shall meet these incomers. He will deliver my terms, which are simple. Leave now, or we shall kill you all. Thank you. That was uh, that was very enjoyable. I look forward to hearing the rest of it. Um, where where can people find you, Daniel? Well, people can find my books online. They're available at all the major online bookstores: Amazon, Google Books, Apple, uh, Barnes and Noble, uh, Kobo, what have you. And that, although Irish mythology uh, for now is exclusive to Amazon. People can also find my podcast wherever they get podcasts. Uh, so I imagine you'll put in a link, but it's House of Legends. And uh, so it's stories uh, from myself and guest storytellers. I, of course, get you on there uh, soon, Ryan. And um, they can also, well, there's also loads of things. There's loads of things I always forget at this point, but they can go on my Instagram, uh, which is at Daniel Allison Author. That's updated a bit more than Facebook, which is House of Legends by Daniel Allison. And uh, probably the absolute best thing to do is to come on my retreat, uh, which is, uh, we had the first one last summer. It was great. So we're going to have another one and make an annual thing. So that's uh, five full days of immersion into animism and living myth in the Scottish Highlands, right on the banks of Loch Tay in the center of the Highlands. Absolutely stunning, stunning place uh, with an amazing group of teachers and storytellers, including the guys from Candlelit Tales, uh, Danica Boyce of Fair Folk Media, uh, Kirsten Milliken, and uh, musician Sam Gillespie from the Brothers Gillespie. Uh, really, really amazing people, stories, good crate, lots of good stuff. That sounds amazing. I uh, wasn't at the retreat last year. I fully intend on being there this year, if possible. Um, but uh, thank you very much for coming on and uh, sharing that uh today i appreciate it uh i'm sure the listeners enjoyed it very much uh and uh i will have you on again to continue the telling and hopefully we can hear more and hear some other tales from you um so let us know what you thought of daniel's reading in the comments um and until next time may the devil walk behind you bye for now <laughs>